Right. Good morning, and I welcome members to the 36th meeting in 2014 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee and ask members to switch off mobile phones. Agenda item one is down to the choice of the deputy convener. Uh, first item of today's agenda is a selection of a deputy convener. The Parliament has agreed that members of the Scottish National Party are eligible to be chosen as deputy convener. This being the case, can I invite nominations for that post, please? May I nominate John Mason for deputy convener? He certainly can. I Jesus, Given that John's not saying anything, I take it he's happy to take on that role, and I therefore take it that the committee is happy to agree that John is our deputy convener from here on. Thank you very much indeed. This does give me the opportunity to thank Stuart McMillan and Richard Baker, who have previously served on this committee and have obviously moved on to pastures new and taking their skills with them. Agenda item two is a decision on taking business in private. It's proposed we take items nine and ten in private. Uh, item 9 is consideration of a paper which will inform our draft report on the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill at Stage 1. And item 10 is a chance for the committee to consider the evidence we're just about to hear from the Minister for Parliamentary Business. Are we agreed to take those items in private, please? Thank you very much. Which brings us to item 3, which is consideration of the work of the committee during the parliamentary year. And I welcome Mr Fitzpatrick, the Minister for Parliamentary Business. Uh, and uh, two Scottish Government officials, Stephen McGregor is the Legislative Programme Manager in the Parliament and Governance Division, and Paul Kekecht is a solicitor in the Scottish Government Legal Directorate. Good morning, gentlemen. Thank you very much com for coming. This is, to my mind, actually one of the highlights of our year because we worry about the process and the things that have happened, and it's good to be able to review that in a positive kind of way. Uh, and I'll invite our first question from John Scott. Thank you very much, uh, Nigel. Uh, good morning. And to start off in a positive way, uh, Minister, uh, the committee's report on instruments considered in 2013-14 noted a reduction in the percentage of instruments reported on from the previous reporting period. Furthermore, this was the second successive report to note a reduction in the percentage of instruments reported on. The committee welcomes these figures and asks what steps the Scottish Government is taking to maintain this improvement and indeed to reduce further the number of instruments reported on. Well, well first of all, I can say thank you to the committee for highlighting um, what is, I think, a, a very positive trend. Um, and I think that's helpful to us in government, helpful to our officials that that, that is, is, is recognised. Um, it's a trend that we do want to continue um, on. Obviously, um, we need to, to do our best to keep our, our standards as, as high as possible. And there's a few things that we have put in place, and it's, it's, it's kind of, I think, a continuing um, development. So one of the things we have is the is detailed guidance for our policy teams, and that is um, constantly being reviewed um, to make sure that we're, we have best practice and that we're making sure that best practice and based on um, you know, changes in the law and um, comments of this committee are all being taken into account with the advice that we, we give to officials. And one of the other things that I think has been very, very successful that we'll be continuing is uh, uh, quarterly seminars um, on SSIs um, to officials, which I think the clerks are, are, have been very helpful um, in, in taking part in. Um, so I think that, that's, that's our, our, our major point, is to just to, to keep that continuing improvement on ongoing and, and that would be our intention but thanks very much to the committee for recognising um, the progress that's been made today. And welcoming it makes our job a great deal easier. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you John. Um, in our report we noted that the number of statutory instruments brought over the period did seem to be significantly lower than in previous periods and I'm just wondering whether you can comment on whether you, whether you feel that is significant or just the way it's fallen out. Not, not really significant. It is just as you, as you say, the way it's fallen out. I mean, different legislation will will have different requirements for um, for instruments, and um, it, it, that there isn't any underlying trend or anything. It's just that um, different different laws, and sometimes it's actually very complex laws have have um, less secondary requirements, and what on the face of it looks like a very non-complex piece of legislation might have uh, requirements for quite a lot of secondary legislation so um, there isn't any underlying trend in, um well if I could then pick up on one of the other trends which we have observed which previously in, in previous years we have seen spikes shall I say in the number of instruments coming through at, at, particularly towards a recess 
that does seem to have been modified a bit. And I'm wondering whether you could talk about the processes because we, we see fewer spikes and that's obviously welcome. We, we have certainly, um, across the organisation, um, put on in, in place um, mechanisms to, to make sure people understand that the desire of this committee not to have these spikes and, and to try to manage spikes down. Um, looking forward, we don't envisage any major spikes, but we are coming towards the end of of the parliamentary session and that always has a, partic a particular pressure which we've already started the process to alert um, uh, bill teams that we need to do our best to make sure that we don't end up with a, a big spike at the end which would put a huge pressure on this committee but maybe I could ask Paul to come in and, and just talk about how we're managing that process. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's really fair to say there's sort of two sorts of spikes, one of which are the timing spikes that relate to traditional times of year when instruments come into force and spikes around end of parliamentary sessions and there may be some that we need to manage in fact around the UK general election next year when there, there may be instruments in, run, done in parallel with them. Um, uh, with, Men's, with Westminster, uh, but the other sort of uh, spikes are the ones that are around individual implementation processes. We may end up um, uh, speaking a bit more about that as in, in, in the course of the meeting this morning, and it's, it was a concern that was raised by the committee when we were last here in April uh, to, to, to ensure that we look forward and plan. I think at that point, with same-sex marriage was, was an implementation process that was upcoming, and we took that away uh, and, 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 and spoke with the, the policy teams to ensure that there was as much uh, proper management of that. So while there were, there, there, there's a risk of big bang implementation that requires a cluster of instruments to be taken together, there was some planning to make sure that was smoothed out, but also to make sure the related instruments were before the committee at the same time so the broader picture can be seen. So it is something of, 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 uh, of, of, of forward planning to ensure that we're, we're alert as to what's upcoming, uh, and that's certainly very much ongoing for the period ahead. We're beginning to look between now and May 2016 about anticipated uh, clusters and groups of instruments that we can ideally plan in a way that makes it easier for you to carry your scrutiny role. That's good, thank you. Uh, if I could just say, I think uh, implementation packages is something we're going to come to a little bit later, as you've suggested. So, but do colleagues want to make any comment just at the moment? Stuart? Um, I, I just wondered if yeah. perhaps you would care to agree that, of course, uh, the convenience of this committee is one thing, but it also would be uh, more efficient use of the resources in drafting and bringing forward these instruments. Um, more efficient use of government resources and civil servants resources for there to be a relatively uniform workload in that respect as well. I would absolutely agree with that. And I think it's, it, it's very much the, the position as far as our drafters are concerned that not only does it put pressure on this committee, but when you have a, a peak of working towards deadlines, that's where the, the, the risk of things requiring to be rushed can be increased and therefore increases the risk. Uh, hopefully, if issues arise, they're minor ones, but it, it's an enhanced risk of that. And the more we can manage that process to take pressure off individual drafters and policy leads, the better. So it's, it's a good point. And with the consequent uh, increased likelihood of accuracy first time round. Correct, which yeah, is absolutely. Helpful to yeah. everyone. Thank you. John, John Scott? Thank you, uh, Essentially, it was the, the movement towards 2016, which you really touched on, but historically there's always been a spike in the last six months prior to any election, as, as far as I could see, uh, but you're obviously aware of that. Yes, and and guidance is all, already in the planning stage um, to, to make sure that we can manage that process as best as possible, so there'll be strong, strong guidance going out to, to, to build teams and officials to make sure, well, to do our best. Yes. I can't guarantee there won't be a spike Understood. coming to the end of the, 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 the kind of 2016 parliamentary session, but you know, we're, we're, we're alert to it and we'll do our best. Yeah, good. Fair enough, thank you. Thank you. you. You've already made mention of interaction with the UK government, which of course happens for all sorts of very good reasons. Um, we've seen a number of instruments which have breached the 28-day rule for the reason that you were trying to lay the same instrument, or sorry, an instrument in the same terms as the UK government for the rest of the UK. Again, entirely understandable. Um, I think you would agreed that you would try and talk to David Mundell MP about how that might work. Perhaps you can report whether there's any progress, please. So, well, we, we certainly have um, flagged that up with Mr Mundell, and I think he's um, in good faith taking that back 
sometimes the pressure he has to they have to deal with uh, are significant as well if there's, there are changes to their legislative programme if there's opposition amendments um, so some things are not entirely within their gift um, but my understanding is Mr Mandel um, does his best to make sure that other government departments um, are alert to the different timings of this parliament um, and you know I think it's, it's going to remain an issue, but I think we'll continue to flag it up with Mr Mandel. Mr Mandel will continue to flag it with government departments, and hopefully that will mean that it won't um, be an issue more often than it has to be. Now, well, I, th I think there will continue to be some times when, for, for various reasons, um, there is a conflict in terms of the different timescales. Um, I think we understand we live in the world of real politics. Not everything's always going to work the way we want it. Uh, John Mason? Thank Thanks, you. Convener. Um, you're probably aware that the committee has had some difficulties scrutinising the delegated powers provisions and bills uh, between stages two and three uh, due to the timescales involved. And, and I was wanting to ask this because I'm also on the Finance Committee and we've also had some issues with timescales around financial uh, memoranda. Um, in its submission to the SPPBA Committee uh, inquiry, therefore, the committee expressed the view that it may be beneficial to extend the period between stages two and three and in turn uh, the time before stage three by which a revised or supplementary delegated powers memorandum must be lodged. Uh, I think when you be came before the committee earlier this year, you said that you would uh, review the matter, and I just wondered if you could tell the committee um, where you are in the progress of having that review. Yeah. Well, so what we have, we've taken on board the committee's concerns from, from, from last year. I think it was just prior to my appearance last year when there were some, some issues that came, came before us. And, and I hope since then we have um, tried to make sure that, that those issues haven't arisen again. Um, and the, kind of, the, the bottom line when I speak to bill teams before introduction of a bill is that they should do absolutely everything possible not to bring new powers in at stage three, which then puts pressure on, 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 this, on this committee. And I think we've, we've um, managed to manage that. Um, I think the other point is if at any stage, you know, this committee is saying that we're not it's just not possible for us to to, um, to to look at this particular these 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 powers. Then you know, in the past, we have extended the times to make sure that can happen. And I think um, we we need to to work together as much as possible. And I'll try to continue to make sure that those kind of pressures that you experienced um, two years ago um, don't don't happen again. Um, but you know, <coughs> within the within the powers that I have. Um, because I can't foresee everything that might, might appear. Go on. To expand on that theme, I mean, one of the points that was made by our legal advisors um, is the interaction of, you know, new powers when introduced at stage three with existing powers, and quite how that matches up or or, you know, the, the ramifications of that, which if it's a constrained time scale, uh, these are things that the, the, the interactions and the ramifications that might occur to you, as it were, in the bath, you know, uh, over a period of time. Whereas if you're working very short time scales, it's, it's harder to possibly understand these kind of thing, issues that may arise. I think your, your point is well made and... Um, you know, so, so the, the, the message that I've been putting out to, to build teams is that, you know, unless there's something exceptional, they really should not be bringing new powers in at, at, at stage three. And, you know, if, if, if they are brought in, then, you know, I certainly appreciate the work that this, this committee and the finance committee do in, 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 in looking at these powers. So um, I think we need to, to make sure that you have the time to do your job, which is part of the process. And remember, for us all, it's about getting legislation which works and is robust at the end of the day um, and that's in everyone's interest so yeah I, I think sitting at this end of the table my perspective is that we as a committee are almost bound to growl at the government if you introduce things at stage three simply because as a matter of process it's got to be bad you know it, it does ask for trouble and I'll do my best to stop you growling wow. it's, yeah thank you um, I'm wondering if we could then move on to packages of instruments because, of course, we, we have seen um, some issues where the quality of drafting plainly wasn't as good as anybody would have wanted, uh, and I can 
quote the examples of the bankruptcy and debt advice and indeed the public bodies joint working Scotland bills, which I think uh, you will be well aware of. Uh, I'm wondering whether you can explain to the committee what you've done to ensure that those kind of multiple errors really don't occur again. Okay. Um, well, obviously, the, the, the first um, set of um, packages was the Police and Fire Reform Act, and you know I think we all learnt a lot from that process. Um, the, and I think last year I, I said that the next major packages that would be coming through would be the, the marriage and civil partnership implementation, and um, I think that's an example of, that, that shows that we have learnt the lessons and you know, working with um, the, the clerks, the committee, and, and other committees, we've managed to make sure. Um, well, I think that that process was what we should be aiming for for everything. But I understand there have been um, some areas where it hasn't worked quite as well as we should um, for, for for particular reasons. Um, but I think you know I think it's it's about communication with between the, the, the committee and and our officials to make sure we all understand what we're trying to do and and the processes around packages. Um, so. There are a few more coming up, and we, and we have um, continuing meetings to take to take that forward to make sure that um, officials are are liaison with clerks um, as part of that process. So there's no surprises. I think is, is perhaps one of the important things. I think John wants to extend that. Yes, indeed. Just sort of developing that theme, we've also had concerns about certain orders which commence sections of an act being brought into force before Parliament is afforded the opportunity to scrutinise these orders. Uh, this occurred in relation to instruments commencing sections of the in the Public Bodies Joint Working Scotland Act 2014 and also the Victims and Witnesses Scotland Act 2014. Now, this is a practice that is concerning to us and we would welcome a commitment from the Minister that efforts be, will be made to avoid um, repetitions of yeah, I mean, these I, I think in, in terms of the, the, the public bodies joint working, um, there was certainly an example where um, we didn't follow um, the correct practice, and I think a letter of apology was sent to the committee on, on that basis. Um, the, the, the time scales for implementation were tight, but nonetheless, we should have followed the procedures that we have in place to, to alert um, the, the committee. Um, of that process, and I think there was a second one where, again, we had to do it um, without using the, the full time scales. But on that, on the second occasion with public bodies, we did follow the, the convention of ex giving an explanation in advance, because I think that makes a difference if you know before something's done. If we've e explained it, in terms of the um, victims and witnesses, um, that was um, it, it was. Slightly unusual in that we, we had a, an agreed commencement date of the 13th of August, which had been worked agreed with the justice partners and you know practical arrangements such as IT, staff training procedures had all been put in place and we were um, online to lay the order within the correct time. Then close to the end, something um, was identified that meant the order couldn't be laid. So there wasn't an intentional... Um, shortening of the time, it was an unexpected change to um, in th th that required a change to the, to the, the delay, a delaying of the, the order being laid. Um, at that point, we could have, we had two choices, either to lay it with a reduced time or change the implementation day, and given that all the work had been done to, with partners for the um, 13th of August being the, the commencement date, it would have been more disruptive to change that. So, um, I mean, the, we always do our best to, to meet the, the kind of timescales that we have agreed to and which are best practice, but I think there will be occasional times when we have to say, look, sorry, on this occasion we haven't managed to keep to the time and here's the reason and, and hopefully the committee accepts the, the reasons. Uh, of, course, of course we do. Um, we hope we are reasonable people. But um, just in, in, as a general principle, if no one likes surprises in government, I'm sure, any more than we do on this committee. And um, if, as a generality, we're able to avoid that in future, then we would welcome that. I think the other thing, that I, the message that I've tried to put out across the organisation, that is, if there's at any point when we can't meet the timescales, etc., that we'd, um, we'd be expected, that we should be as transparent about that as possible and, and be as upfront as we can, um, so that the committees <laughs> have the maximum time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. Steve? Um, 
I, just on a sort of parallel thing, it just occurs to me that there are uh, bits of acts that, uh, although on the statute book for some considerable time, have not been commenced. Um, now, in some cases, that's deliberate. I, I recall when I took the climate change bill through in 2009 that we had some bits in that that we, we, we said in the debate would only be commenced under some contingent circumstances, and that's fair enough. But I just wondered whether we, we, we have any sense uh, whether since 1999, when we started legislating here, there are bits of our legislation which have yet to be commenced. I suspect you probably don't know, but I just wonder if it's perhaps time we looked at it. If, well, well I, I don't know off the top of my head have to say the answer to that question. I, I know it, 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 it's an issue, um, and there's clearly um, a, a, an obligation um, where Parliament has decided that a piece of legislation should be enacted, that it should then respect the, 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 the will of the Parliament and then at the appropriate time uh, proceed to, to, to give effect to that. Sometimes that can take a little while. The example you give was an interesting one because the Parliament understood that in the climate change example there was going to be some, some delay before that, 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 that took well, effect. It might never be and in, 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 But that was in, part so, of the debate. But, yeah, yeah. but I mean, certainly the, uh, the, the, the principle that, um, uh, uh, that, that the respect should be shown for the decision of the Parliament to enact that legislation and it should be commenced is, is, is certainly quite important. Uh, I don't know... I, I, I can't actually think of any particular examples. Of, I don't know off the top of my head since 1999. I know that there, there are some older pieces of legislation from Westminster that, for various reasons... Um, have, 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 have not been commenced or some acts that are not yet fully commenced for, for, for various reasons. Don't, don't pin me down on what they are. I'd have to go back <laughs> to the memory banks, but I'm, I'm conscious of the issue. I'm not aware of any off the top of my head in the Scottish Parliament, but I, I don't have a comprehensive, a comprehensive knowledge of the... Maybe uh, you can take that away and have a wee look and see if, there's, yeah. if it's not too onerous to pull that together. Yeah. Well, yes, yes. I, I would... It is only curiosity, not necessity. So if it proves to look onerous, I, I don't think... I have to say, I'm not entirely sure whether it's in the remit of this committee, but on the other hand, if, if you don't know what policy you're looking for, it's difficult to say which other committee's responsibility it is. So, so perhaps it is ours in default. It might be just worth a quick subtime. Mm. See if it's easy to... See, see what there is. It might, yeah. not John? In developing that theme, if a piece of legislation hasn't been commenced and therefore hasn't been used or required, is there a kind of de facto argument for saying, well, if it hasn't been used after, shall we say, 15 years, should be a sunset clause on it? Or? I think that would be something for relevant committees to, to look at, I, I suppose, going forward. Um, and perhaps sometimes these things would be picked up with uh, future consolidation exercises. Um, if I could take you on to transitional provisions, please. I'm conscious that we had some cases which indicated that maybe the processes needed to change a little. Conscious that the government has made some commitments about the way it brings forward transitional provisions. Um, but also conscious that whilst that's a very good working relationship with the government, and, and that's appreciated, although we do have one exception, um, it's not yet in standing orders and I suppose my concern is that a future government would not be bound. And actually, as a committee, I think we would want you, in a sense, to be, to be given some standing, some statutory instructions on how to deal with transitional uh, arrangements, simply because they have caused trouble in the past. So I'm wondering what your, your feeling about that yeah. at the moment is, please. I, mean, I think we need to be careful to make sure we continue to have the flexibility within the system um, in order to make sure we have appropriate best practice, I think, Perhaps one of the one of the challenges would be um, to to work out where the the provisions are are significant, for instance, and, and how we would define such things it might be difficult. And certainly, what we don't want to get into the the, the position is is where that we are spending huge amounts of your time and our time arguing over whether a, a package is significant or not. And um, so, I mean, I, I think the, the the situation we have where we we try to lay with 40 days to, to give extra time for, the, for these packages. Um, the, um, the time that we spend um, discussing with, with um, clerks and your, and your uh, legal advisors, I think it's all very well well spent, and it's getting us to, to make sure that we don't have these errors. You know, and not, these errors are, are 
are very infrequent, but you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to underplay the significance of, of the, the cases that you've highlighted. Mm. In, in I, think, I think the difficulty, Minister, is, is that whilst they are very rare, they do turn out to be significant when we get there. That's, that's kind of the problem. If they do rear their heads, then it's not a minor case. And, uh, uh, I, I, just, I just wonder whether some kind of, of provision whereby you, we have in standing orders that you have to allow the kind of timing and, and so on that, the, that you're now doing, but that we're, if you were to write to the presiding officer and explain that you felt this was an exception, as happens in some other instances, that might be a kind of provision with which you could live on which the committee could then see there was a, a, a written down process? I, I, I just think the challenge, the challenge is around the complexity of, of determining you know, what's a package, what's not a package. And, um, I think, I think you know, we're, we're certainly trying to work to a standard which, which gives you the, 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 the maximum amount of time. Um, we're also doing some work in terms of um, making sure that we have um, robust executive notes attached to the, 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 um, the, the, the instruments so for the kind of legal explanation and also perhaps more importantly for the committee, um, uh, clear uh, plain English policy notes um, so that people can understand what the, the whole package is trying to trying to do, and and why why we're doing it the way we're doing it. Um, but I mean, Paul, do you want to go on this? Yeah. I, mean, yeah, I, I suppose my, my my point would be the same one about flexibility. I mean, if if whether it's a practice or whether it's a standing order, there are circumstances in which it would it would be um, it, it would not be appropriate to apply it. So it would need to work in a kind of flexible kind of way. Um, and uh, we've certainly worked very hard to make sure, as far as we can, that that, that, that policy teams know what the, the 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 commitment the commitment is, and it generally. It has, has been adhered to. Where it hasn't been, I suspect, would have written to you and said, this is the reason why we're not adhering to it. So there's a question as to whether that would have um, uh, would have made a difference in, 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 in the circumstances and the issue the Minister makes about how do you define complex when it's working out um, whether something would be caught by that rule or not. It would probably be unhelpful to end up having discussions with the committee about defining complex, which takes your eye off. The real issue is actually making sure that we do it properly in the first place. Okay, I, I'm grateful for the discussion. Clearly, we're not going to resolve anything now, so uh, that's that's now on the record. And perhaps we could go on to consolidation with Stuart Stevenson, please. Uh, yes, I, I noted, Minister, you uh, you said that we should have legislation that works, and in that connection, I just wonder uh, whether, in particular, in relation to secondary legislation, um, significant sequences of amending secondary legislation, perhaps particularly where there are lists being updated in secondary legislation. Um, in one instance that I, I think we looked at, there were 18 separate amendments to a list. Um, wh whether the, the, the government has a clear view of at what point it should go back to base and consolidate so that... Uh, someone who wishes to know what the law is does not inadvertently misunderstand by failing to spot one of the many amendments. Yeah, I think um, it is an important point. Obviously, there's a, a, a resource issue in that we couldn't consolidate everything. It's not just a matter of taking the amendments into the text. It's sometimes it's about rewrite, rewriting the, the instrument in terms of modern day language um, and, and, and proper drafting procedure. Um, so it, it can be more than, than it might look to a, a layperson, more, more work intensive. But we have taken forward 10 consolidations um, between 2013-14. So in the, in, the, in the reporting year that we're looking at, there was 10 consolidations, so that's more than the year before. We've already done a further two this year. Um, and you know the, the, the trend is that we're doing more each year. Um, and it, it's, there's, no, there's no question that a consolidated instrument is... Um, much easier for everyone to, to follow. Clearly, instruments which are intended for lawyers, uh, it's less important um, that they are, they're consolidated than ones which are intended for end users and members of the public in particular to understand. Um, so they're, they're, they, that, that's certainly something that we'd have to take into account. One of the other things we take into account in terms of determining is, is this committee. So, I mean, if you're flagging up, particularly that you've 
dealt with um, some amendments that you think um, are amendments on amendments, and it's it's gone a, a stage further than then we would um, look at that for, for consolidation as well. And maybe that's something we could look at a way of formalising that um, going forward. Um, yes, Minister, I understand when you talk about lawyers, but might there not be merit in uh, legislation being so simple that even lay people could understand it and thus avoid the expense of employing lawyers? In an ideal world, always. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, however, <laughs> let, 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 me, let me now uh, move on. But, but, but equally, Minister, given that the drafter of an amendment to uh, a piece of secondary legislation that perhaps does not conform to the present standards for drafting and layout and so on and so forth will necessitate the drafter of that amendment considering what the bill, the, the instrument looks like after amendment they will of necessity have produced a copy of the, the <coughs> secondary legislation in its new amended form. And therefore, are they perhaps not very welcome as the consolidations have been, uh, even more opportunities for consolidation in future? Sure. Yeah. In, in, in practice, it, it will not, won't necessarily be the case that the, the, the amender will have a consolidated version, but they'll have to work through a heavily amended instrument, certainly to work out what the current law is, to know what amendments to, that, that, that are required to be made. So that, that's certainly true. I mean, the, one of the things that I reflect on uh, when I hear the question and think of the, the responses here uh, is that a number of circumstances are different as to what the purpose of legislation is and what the purpose of amendment is. You, you give the example of lists, you make a very valid point that actually the purpose of legislation is to be used in the real world at the end of the day. Uh, and there are some pieces of legislation that are more directly used by, 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 by the outside world. Um, and that's a factor that, that would point to those being as up-to-date and as modern as possible. Lists are a kind of example of that in many ways uh, where that, that makes sense. The age of the instrument is important the number of times it's been amended and the number of times in which amendments have been amended can make it particularly compl complicated as well. And in, in, in a strange kind of way, picking up on the point about resources, the older the instrument and more out of date the drafting, the more sensible it is to consolidate, but also the harder at work, work it is to update all the references and to bring things into, in, 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 into modern, modern uh, drafting practice, which means we might actually not achieve as many numerically, because we focus on the ones that need them most. So there, there, all these factors come into play in deciding what the, um, uh, the, the, the end outcome should be. But certainly the idea of making legislation as modern, as up-to-date and as accessible as possible and as easy to use is, is certainly an aspiration that clearly makes sense and we would agree with. Well, let me move on to the accessibility issue. Um, the website legislation.gov.uk that I think is uh, under the control of the UK government but to which we clearly contribute with our legislation, uh, where primary legislation is concerned, it will in due course, sometimes at a relatively leisurely pace of years, um, reflect amendments that have been made by other pieces of legislation so you can see what's been deleted and you can see what's been added and you can in essence read from top to bottom and, th and that's very helpful but there is no similar process in relation to secondary legislation. Uh, is it perhaps time we should be looking at using that facility when we're not moving to consolidation to at least give people better access to the sense of what an amended piece of secondary legislation might look like? One of the challenges, I think, will be the kind of level of um, the numbers of secondary um, instruments there are across the UK. So if, you were, if that was to be done quickly for the whole UK, it would be a, a pretty sizable piece of work to be done. But I think in an ideal world, then clearly, you know, we're moving, increasingly moving to an online, an online world and um, we, we need to make sure that we're using um, that to the max, so maybe it's something we should look at as to whether we can perhaps suggest that Scotland might be a pilot or something in terms of taking that forward and there might be an opportunity there. I, I don't know, but because it is, is a, a UK-wide resource um, which, which, we, which ourselves and, and the other, uh, the Welsh Assembly and, and Northern Ireland are, are, um, are part of, um, but we're not the major players because obviously the major players are the, are the UK government with the largest number of instruments. So. Um, 
I think I think it's a it's a valid point that we should um, try and um, e examine and see if there is a potential to to use that resource so that we have that kind of um, online transparency and um, usability. It, it, it is certainly true. There's a lot of legislation. I looked at my own records from my five years or so as a minister, and I brought forward 127 pieces of secondary legislation. So, yes, there is a lot of it. Scottish government, but you can imagine across UK, it's even more. Yeah. So. Convenient. Thank, Thank you, uh, John. Yes. Thank you. Um, next area to touch on was the, the teachers' pension scheme regulations 2014. Uh, now, I think the committee has previously expressed uh, concern about the quality of the drafting uh, of the, these pension scheme regulations. Uh, although we welcomed the amended version of the instrument, which corrected the errors. Um, the committee, however, understands that there are plans to lay further pension instruments. Um, can the committee be given any assurance that uh, in the kind of problems that we had in the past will not be repeated in the future? Well, obviously, sometimes you just have to put your hand up and, and thank the committee for bringing some to our attention, and that's what happened in this case. And um, I think we took the right action by withdrawing that that particular order and, and laying other ones and and. Yes, um, we have um, redoubled our efforts to make sure that there's, there's proper, proper checking um, to make sure that the quality is as high as possible. Um, there's a, a degree of, of work going on across the organisation, um, which maybe uh, Paul again, do you want to talk about the, the kind of the, the efforts that we're making to improve quality of, of the well, yes, instruments? That, that was an instrument that certainly the, there's no doubt as far as the, the government's concerned in my direction, it was concerned that we let ourselves down on that instrument. There's no doubt we didn't do the professional job we ought to have done. Um, and um, we were able to uh, resolve the issue so that at least insofar as uh, nobody would be adversely affected because the amendments won't take effect and think, uh, until 1st April next year. Uh, but that, that was certainly an example of where the proper processes weren't applied and weren't followed. We, it's an example, again, uh, where we need to remain vigilant in the overarching control processes uh, and, and responding to the, the scrutiny of, of, of the committee. But yes, we have taken steps to make sure that the, the particular area of activity concerned that proper procedures are followed uh, and that obviously will include future pensions regulations uh, to make sure that the processes we have to ensure high quality uh, of instruments are followed uh, uh, in order to avoid that difficulty happening again. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Margaret. Good morning, everyone. Um, the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. The committee recently considered this bill and we were actually disappointed by the lack of explanation off offered in relation to the number of powers within the bill. We also find a number of powers to be broad and ill-defined. While not common, this isn't the first bill to present concerns of this nature. And the committee has invited the Scottish Government to reflect on a number of powers in the bill. But we would welcome the Minister's perspective in general terms on, taking, on the taking of broad powers, but little explanation is offered for their taking. Um, obviously, the Community Empowerment Bill is a, an unusual bill in terms of um, the, the kind of... It's, it's a framework bill, and we, and we do try to avoid bringing forward framework, framework bills. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wide bill that actually... Um, It will be driven by, by communities in terms of how it's actually implemented. So to, to, to rigidly say, here are the powers and here's exactly what they're going to be used for, that might be difficult because it's not actually going to be for government to say how it's used. It'll be for, for the communities um, to, to, to see how it's been taken forward. Um, I, I guess one of the, the, the kind of strengths of the system we have in the Scottish Parliament is that you know, as, any, if any, of these, as any, any of these powers are being um, drafted, then they would have to come back to Parliament for scrutiny um, so that there is a, still a process to make sure that when the, the bill is actually, when the powers are actually being used, they've been used appropriately and, and correctly and, and so there is still that, that, um, that opportunity. But it is a, is a framework bill and, and they're, they're pretty unusual and we have, I think, across the, 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 the sessions of the Scottish Parliament since 1999, I think um, successive governments have tried to, to steer away from framework um, bills as much as possible because of the, the kind of concerns that the committee is raising. But um, I think this is one case where um, a framework bill is appropriate because of the type of bill that it is and what the, what the bill is trying to do. Um, so, 
Can I ask, I'm, I'm not really sure, when you say um, you're leaving it quite broad so as the communities can decide how to sort of implement it, but if it's that broad and there's no defined sort of guidelines, how will the communities understand how they can actually use the bill? Well, the, the, the bill is, is obviously been, been, been drafted in a way that is, is, is about enabling, enabling communities. I mean, one of, one of the things that we've tried to do is to improve the, the, the memoranda that's, that's around the bills, because I, I guess that's the tool that folk can use to see what a bill is trying to do and how it's trying to get there. And so I think we've, we've done a, a fair bit of work um, in trying to um, get to the point where committees feel that these memoranda are, are more useful and, and I think we've, we've hopefully are, are making progress on that. Um, we're still, I think it's a, it's a work in practice and maybe if I can bring Stephen in just to, to talk about um, how we can get the information in those memoranda that, that you're seeking because sometimes that's the challenges that we're, we're, we're trying to give you what you want and sometimes you don't quite understand that. Is so. so there's an ongoing process to try and improve that. Yeah, we are trying to work with um, bill teams across the government to drive up standards of delegate powers memorandums. But one thing that would be really helpful for us to have an idea of is what the committee thinks is a good memorandum and perhaps a less good memorandum. Then we can show that to, to future bill teams to give them practical examples of the sorts of information that the committee might be looking for. So in this case, if there was further information that the committee would have expected to have heard about those powers, and that's certainly something we'll reflect on for the future if similar types of bills come forward. John? Yeah, I mean, I'm probably a bit old-fashioned, a bit naive, but I mean, it seems, I mean, we are a parliament, um, and it seems like a new kind of concept in law where essentially we make it up as we go along. And I'm just not all fair with that. Are there other examples of where this happens elsewhere in the world, or what's the precedent for well, right, it's a, it's departure a, from it's accepted a, norms? It's a framework bill, and maybe <clears throat> Paul can say when there's been other framework bills? Um, well, yeah, I mean, the, 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 it, 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 a lot of it depends on context. I, I know, for example, in, in, in the European context, that it's quite often that, that kind of framework legislation is made, but that, because that, that allows different member states, for example, to reflect the individual circumstances of, 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 of the state. It's less, less commonly used in, 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 in the UK, but it can be relevant where... Um, it, it, uh, circumstances, it, it's understood that circumstances will change uh, in, in, in the future uh, or that they're um, uh, to contain all the detail that would be required um, would actually make for absolutely enormous primary legislation so there can be circumstances where the, kind of the detail is better set out in, 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 in secondary um, I'm trying to think of, of examples of any anything like a framework. I suppose the welfare reform bill was, was something that, that, that was a short bill um, that uh, allowed for the detail to be worked out at, at, at a later stage in a way that would be appropriate both for secondary level of scrutiny but also allow for relatively quick amendment as, as circumstances develop. Obviously, the, the primary legislation process uh, is, is a full level of scrutiny and takes some time normally to go through, whereas secondary has the advantage of having both scrutiny, but also can be flexible in terms of speed of change if change were needed. I, I suppose just as parliamentarians, we're very jealous of our, our right to make legislation. And if, if, if you're telling us that our communities can now just sort of say, here's, a, here's an idea, can we float this past you and turn it into legislation, which in essence appears to be what you're saying, given the breadth of these powers that are being assumed and the community's no, right to I, assume them. I think, I think um, the point is that when the powers are, are, are put into instruments, then that comes back to the Parliament. So the final um, powers, when the powers are being used, the Parliament... Um, has, has oversight of that but process. I'm not it's not certain a, that's the level of scrutiny um, to which we've been used to having, shall we? <clears throat> well, I think. Uh, <laughs> There's an interesting philosophical or well, jurisprudential or something conversation yeah. to be had about that, isn't there? And maybe that's not yeah. something we can extend given the timetables we're working on. But, but it, it does represent a change. And I think it probably colleagues are reflecting the fact that we do not, in practice, up till now, uh, scrutinise secondary legislation in the same kind of way as we've scrutinised bills and maybe what we need to flag up is in these kind of bills and possibly regulatory reform would be another one you do actually need to get subject committees to have a different approach to the secondary legislation but can I just pick up on one of the issues that has occurred is that we've finished up in a position where even interrogating 
officials around the table, we've not been receiving an explanation of why a power is needed. Now, that's relatively rare, and we've had some pretty vague answers as to why other powers are needed. And I'm just hoping, Minister, that you appreciate that that does cause us a problem, because if you can't explain even theoretically why something might be needed, it's a tad difficult to see that it's needed. I think that's, that's a good point, and clearly our, our officials should be able to, or, or the minister in charge should be able to, to give those the specific answers to why, why we've drafted something that we've drafted. I think in, in an ideal world, again, that should be clear from the Delegate Powers Memoranda. So it, it, that, that's where I think we want to get to the point that you're satisfied that that information is there. And so I think, you know, Stephen's point... That's a very fair point. That that's a very fair point. I think... Yeah, John, let's go back to John. I would just say, I mean, it's excruciatingly difficult for us as a committee who, who deal with the minutia of bills when we are interrogating officials who have no idea why they're there, apparently. And I'm possibly exaggerating the situation, but it, it, it's, it's really not reasonable in parliamentary terms to, to allow officials to come here with no concept of why they are here when offered an explanation. I think, I think so clearly if, if, if you're looking for answers to why we have, we're asking for powers, then you should be able to get those answers, there's no question. Excellent. Thank you. Stu. I wonder if we might think of it in this way, Minister, that we would normally expect secondary legislation to be about the implementation details of policies that have been discussed and agreed by Parliament and incorporated in primary legislation. But... When we're looking at framework bills, we move to something that quite often has a different character. It's actually about the creation of new policy via secondary legislation, rather than merely the implementation of policy that's already been discussed. So therefore, if this committee expresses some indication that we need to tread carefully, I think that's probably what underpins our saying so. And in particular, there is a process difference when we're looking at the creation of new policy by secondary instrument compared to primary, in that that denies parliamentarians the opportunity to amend. Yes, reject in toto and invite the government to come back with a, with a revised thing. So, so therefore, there is a process issue that I think you know, properly should concern us uh, here uh, in, in, in looking at the way this works. But fundamentally, there is that difference, it seems to me, between using SSIs to describe implementations and using SSIs to create new policies that you might care to consider, Minister. That's a, a reasonable point. Uh, I think it's a very helpful point. Thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm wondering whether Margaret McCulloch wants to move on. Um, yeah, um, the committee has been concerned also by the number of minor points arising from instruments in recent months, and we believe that it is in the interest of the users of these instruments that such errors are avoided. What steps have been taken to reduce the number of minor points arising out of instruments? I think you're absolutely right. It is in, absolutely in the interest of Europe, uh, users that um, um, instruments are unambiguous and in... And, 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 in language that, that, that is clear what the intent is, and, and that's always always our aim, and we, from time to time, are very grateful to the committee for flagging up where, where we've got it wrong um, and, and, and for pointing out any ambiguity within um, the drafting. Um, but we obviously have ongoing um, policies to try and make sure that we're, we've got clarity of drafting um, and good, plain English policies um, that, that's an ongoing process, which perhaps, again, Paul, you want to... I think it is important that we, within the government, maintain and strengthen our cross-cutting role uh, in ensuring that there's proper quality of instruments that come to the Parliament. We have processes in place. Uh, we have extensive guidance uh, on what's good practice uh, in order to eliminate, obviously, major problems as, as, as well as minor ones. We need to continue to do that, and some of the experience I've spoken about earlier this morning shows that the need, as, as I said earlier, to be vigilant to make sure that we, we, we maintain our qualities, uh, our quality of instruments. Um, we're conscious that 
I'm in a relatively small directorate with quite a lot of continuity of legal staff who, who, who gain experience and develop skills um, in, in, in drafting, and that can help because they gain that experience. But equally, there are new people that come into my directorate, and there are policy people who are not who are less experienced in, in, in instructing second legislation, uh, and they don't see. The, these sort of wider issues and, and the need for, need, need for consistency and the processes we have in place are designed to ensure that we're consistent, up to date, reflecting the points that are made by this committee and trying as far as we can to, 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 to minimise the, the, the risk of errors. Um, we need to, to, to ensure that uh, we, we train our staff and, and, and keep them up, up to speed with, with, with best practice, just be, simply because it's, you know, it, 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 it's such an important point to, 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 to maintain those standards and eliminate particularly the minor, point, the minor points as far as we can. Okay, thank you. Good, okay. Thank you. If I could just move on then to the European Union opt-outs, which occurred very recently. You'll be aware on the 1st of December, the Scottish Government had to bring forward uh, the mutual recognition of criminal financial penalties and the mutual recognition of supervision measures, uh, European legislation. Uh, I have to say, I think that's worked very well. We will, in fact, be reporting that later in the meeting, but it's worth putting on the record. That does seem to have been a very successful process. However, it's one we could really do without very often, and I'm just wondering whether you could comment on whether there's likely to be any more. I, I, I don't think I could guarantee, guarantee that um, we won't find ourselves in a similar situation again, but I, I don't think it's going to come every week. I think it, is, it, was, it was a very unusual set of circumstances, and um, I, I guess if, if anything either the same or similar um, comes again, then I think our approach of engaging with the committee at the earliest possible opportunity to, to find a way forward that allows you to do your job um, within whatever the restrictions that we, we have in place. I mean, this was, was very unusual and it had to be laid on a specific day. Um, and, and so it, was, it was, was very, very unusual. And it had to come into force on that same day as well. Um, so that, that was very unusual. And I think that the lesson from this is that you know, if, if we kind of sit down and, and work out a way forward, then actually we can do something that lets you do your job and lets us um, get the instrument in place in time. Yeah, thank you. And I would simply reiterate on behalf of the committee, I think it was a very successful process. We're going to formally report it later as being in, in default, but nonetheless, in, under the circumstances, sorry, because we have actually no option. Uh, but I think it's worth making sure that actually it worked very well and we're very grateful. Um, which I think brings us to Margaret for probably the last issue, please. Yeah, the Scottish Law Commission Bill. Um, we, as a committee, re recently completed its stage one consideration of the legal right and counterparts in Delivery Scotland Bill. This is obviously the first Scottish Law Commission Bill. Can you offer the committee any reflections on the process so far, please? Yeah, I think it's, it's worked very well, and I think it's, it's shown um, that actually we've, we've got a mechanism now where these um, reports of the Law Commission were previously not being given the, the attention that they deserved. We've now got a mechanism whereby, um, under very strict circumstances and um, and clear criteria that we can take things forward. This one does appear, I think, to have worked very well. We're not quite there yet, but we're already in the process of looking at what the next bill will be. And, and we've identified in the programme for government a, a small technical succession bill, um, which we think might meet the criteria. So that consultation is has started for that. And you know, if it does, assuming that it does meet the criteria, then we would be expecting that to come forward. Um, soon and to, to this committee and through that process um, and I, I think our, our kind of working assumption is that there'll be one of these these bills every year is kind of the, the, the rate so not a level that's going to swamp this committee and prevent you from doing the other things that you have to do but at a level that makes sure that we are um, given the, the the law commission um, it's it's due regard thank you I've already answered my second question on that no nope, that's fine thank you very much well done. Thank you. Do colleagues have any further questions? John? Yes. Um, one of the things that concerns me, and it may not even be a, a relevant question for today, but just at what level of post-legislative scrutiny is ongoing at the moment? Because I know all parties talk about it um, at the run-up to elections and we must do more. I'm just wondering how much we are doing at the moment. And indeed, Given the increased workload that we're going to have post-2016, we will have even less time thereafter, I suspect, to carry that out. But you could perhaps 
reassure me that, of course, there's a lot of it going on at the moment. I, th I think that really that's probably a matter for subject committees to determine when, when they feel that they should be doing um, post-led scrutiny. And obviously, it would be a matter for another committee to determine if, if our processes need to be changed. And I think there obviously was a recent, recent review um, by the SPPAC committee on that, that very subject. Um, but, you know, I think... Um, it would, it's, it's clear up to sub subject committees if they, if they want to, to do more um, post-ledge scrutiny or not. Thank you. Right, well, thank you very much, Minister, and colleagues for coming along. That's, uh, I suppose, almost inevitably gone beyond the remit of the report, which is already well past, well past history. Um, I, I suspect formally we'd be hoping to, for a, a written response from yourself to that report, but I suspect today's official report will be far more interesting than what you might like to send us. But, We'll um, take into account the discussions we've had today as part of that, that right. response. Thank you. Okay. Thank much you. obliged. Thank you very much. And I'll suspend this meeting briefly. Thank you.
Agenda item four, which is instruments subject to affirmative procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the regulation of investigatory powers, modification of authorised authorization provisions, legal consultation, Scotland 20, order 2015 draft, nor on the regulation of investigatory powers, covert surveillance and property interference, code of practice, Scotland order 2015 draft, nor on the regulation of investigatory powers, covert human intelligence sources, code of practice, Scotland order 2015 draft, nor on the children's hearing, Scotland order 2011, rules of procedure in children's hearings, amendment rules 2015 draft, nor on the Secure Accommodation Scotland Amendment Regulations 2015 draft. The committee may wish to note that the second and third of these instruments I've just listed were initially laid before Parliament on the 2nd December. They were then withdrawn and relayed on the 8th of December as the committee's legal advisor identified that the date of issue of the Code of Practice as stated in Article 2.1b of each order was not correct. Is the committee content with the instruments, please? Thank you. Agenda item five, instruments subject to negative procedure, the mutual recognition of criminal financial penalties in the European Union, Scotland number two, order 2014, SSI 2014 336, and the mutual recognition of supervision measures in the European Union, Scotland regulations 2014, SSI 2014 337. The same points have been raised by our legal advisers on both of these instruments. There's been a failure to observe the requirements of section 28.2 of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010. The instruments were laid before Parliament and came into force on the 1st of December 2014, so the requirement to leave a minimum of 28 days between laying and coming into force had not been complied with. <coughs> the committee may, however, wish to find the breach acceptable in this instance, instance due to the urgent circumstances which have arisen. Powers in Section 2.2 of the European Communities Act 1972 could only be used to make the instruments no earlier than the 1st of December, as on that date the UK Government opted into the Council Framework Decision 2009-299-JHA, to which the orders give effect. The Framework Decision also required to be fully transposed and implemented on the 1st of December. The Committee might also welcome the Scottish Government provided it with early notice of its proposals for these orders and of the unusual set of circumstances which required the breach of the 28-day rule. Um, well, I recognise we are obliged under the rules to report this breach. I think we should record our forgiveness of it and our congratulations to the Government on uh, uh, quite properly dealing with this the way the, in the way that we uh, we have seen them uh, dealt with and if we uh, discount through our forgiveness these two breaches we probably today anticipating the rest of the agenda uh, are in a position where all the procedures before us we have been pleased with and we would like that to continue uh, 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 indeed. Uh, would, I, would, I be, would I be right in reflecting the committee's view that actually the procedure that we've been through and just previously dis discussed with the Minister for Parliament does seem to have been the right procedure on those very rare circumstances, hopefully not to be repeated? Uh, and we can encourage the government to think in those terms in the future, should it have to. I think um, the government played it absolutely properly as far as my limited knowledge takes me, but in the unlikely circumstances set of events are occurring again, then I think we now have a model to follow in future. Yep. Thank you. Does the committee agree to draw the instruments to the Parliament's attention on reporting ground grey J, as there has been a failure to observe the requirements of section 28.2 of the Interpretation of Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010? Does the committee agree, however, to report that it finds the breach to be completely acceptable in this incident and to welcome the fact the Scottish Government gave the committee early notice of its proposals for these orders and the reasons for the breach? Thank you very much. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the land and building transaction tax prescribed proportions, Scotland Order 2014, SSI 2014, 350 nor on the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax Qualifying Public or Educational Bodies, Scotland Amendment Order 2014, SSI 2014, 351, nor on the Land and Buildings Transaction Tax tr Definition of Charity, Relevant Territories, Scotland Regulations 2014, SSI 2014, 352. Is the committee content with these instruments, please? Agenda item six, instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Reservoir Scotland Act 2011, commencement number one, order 2014, SSI 2014, 348, nor on the Act of the Journal, Criminal Procedure, Rules Amendment number two, miscellaneous 2014, SSI 2014, 349. Is the committee content with those instruments, please? Agenda item seven is the Mental Health Scotland Bill. 
this item of business is consideration of the Scottish Government's response to the Committee's Stage 1 report on this Bill. Members have seen the briefing paper and the response from the Scottish Government. Do members have any comments, please? Stuart. Um, I'm, I'm still not very comfortable with um, what we have in front of us in relation to the Government's response. Um, it, it, it specifically, the Government is restating its intention to publish guidance meant under Section 17C brackets 2, but contends still that there is not a requirement for the guidance to be published. Now, that's fine as far as it goes, except that they then go on to say that the guidance will only achieve its intended purpose if it's made available to victims who wish to make representation under the new victim representation scheme. So it seems to me rather strange that the government simultaneously asserts that this only achieves its objective if it's made available to people, while also asserting that it does not <coughs> wish to make it a legal requirement that it be published. And I, I, I find myself unable to reconcile these two points. Could I suggest that, John wants to come in, but could I suggest that, as I would understand this, and I do think it's probably acceptable, it's a principle of law, you don't write down something you don't need to write down, and in exactly the same way that a car can't operate if it hasn't got an engine, so you don't need to say a car has to have an engine, something that can't operate unless it is published doesn't need to say in law that it needs to be published. I wonder whether our legal advisors would care to comment on that, and then I'll bring John in. Is that a fair interpretation of the principle? Absolutely, with Stuart, um, perhaps unusually, but... Um, I, I would. And we've heard um, this morning in the earlier session government ministers making a case for bringing forward um, framework legislation, I think it was wonderfully called, um, where there's apparently no reason for bringing it forward at all, except. So, I, I mean, there's, there's a, a different sense of standards operating here within government, uh, which I think poses its own questions. Um, so I agree entirely with Stuart, and I think we as a committee should adhere to our position, um, which is the one that, that the guidance should be published. If any committee in Parliament is about openness and transparency, it has to be this one. And um, let's stick with our position. Well, I would merely reflect the government says it is going to publish it because it must. Um, I'm just wondering whether I could... Forgive me, John. I'm just wondering whether I could actually get one of our legal advisors to make comment on, on this position, please. The, there, would, there, would, there, would, there would have to be a requirement in the bill for publication to bind both, both uh, the government and future in, in administrations in relation, to, in relation to publication. You know, if it wasn't specified in the bill, there wouldn't be a, there wouldn't be a, requir there wouldn't, there a requirement. There wouldn't be a statutory requirement for publication otherwise. Forgive me, I, I'm, I'm still not... I seem to be the only one arguing this corner, but I'm still not concerned about a statutory requirement because if the only way it operates is by publication, then I'm not seeing why, as a matter of law, as I understand it, it needs to be published because it must be published, if that doesn't sound totally perverse. Well, convener, if I may agree with you that the must is the logical imperative if the policy uh, position is to be delivered, as the government themselves explain. But in the absence of there being a legal requirement to publish, this government or any future government would be acting within the law if it chose not to publish. And there would be no parliamentary sanction, short of bringing forward parliamentary legislation, to require a government to publish, which would mean that the policy of making victim representation scheme available to complainants it would fail and that is an important part of this legislation. So um, while I understand the analogy of tyres and wheels and cars, I'm not convinced by it, convener. Do forgive me. Could I, could I suggest then, because I think we've already heard enough to know there's obviously a disagreement here, could I offer to write to the government drawing their attention to this conversation, asking them to clarify why they think they're in the position they are, John? Just for clarification, maybe I'm not understanding it. Are they drawing a distinction between publishing on the one hand and making it available to victims on the other hand? Are these two separate things? Yes, yes. totally. See, right. let's be clear, they're not suggesting this won't be available. It only operates yes. if it is available. 
but they're suggesting it can be available without being published. The, what they're arguing is there's no need to say that it must be published because it has no existence if it isn't published. It can't operate if it isn't published. In exactly the same way the car isn't a car without a motor, it's a go-kart. Margaret? Yeah, uh, again, I apologise if it's a stupid question, but if it's not published and you're a victim, how do you know the publication is there for you to access? That's precisely the point. What the government, as I understand it, and I am arguing their corner, is, is saying is that as a matter of policy, it will have to be made available. Therefore, it will have to be published. Therefore, there's no need to say that it must be published because actually it must be published. And on the back of that, why is there a problem for the government not wanting to publish it? I, I would argue that's just a legal principle that you don't write down something which is redundant. In other words, in exactly the same way that you don't write something twice. We don't want something twice in statutes. We actually complain if it's in two different places. And you wouldn't write down as a matter of drafting practice. As I understand it, and here I am talking as a non-lawyer, never mind as a drafter, you wouldn't write it down if it was a, uh, it was a logical imperative. You simply wouldn't write it down because it's actually a logical imperative. I, I think, Rina, you've offered to write to the government in the yep. light of this discussion, and I think that's a helpful offer. Well, we I think it's a committee would like me to do that. Let's, let's do on. so because... Of, yeah, okay, the point's obviously very well made and it will be extensively reviewed on the official report. Um, right, in which case, let me just come back to wherever on earth I've now got to. Um, right, sorry, let's just, let's just make sure I know where we are. We're, we're actually here, aren't we? Yes, so the question was, do members have any comments? And the answer is yes, quite a few. Um, and uh, 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 Clearly, do we want to note the response? I think the answer will be yes, to, and I agree that I write to the government to, to seek clarification on that point. I would just ask, are there any other points, or are we content with everything else? We are. Thank you very much. Okay. We will write. Agenda item eight is Public Bodies Act Consent Memorandum. This item of business is consideration of the Public Bodies Abolition of Homegrown Timber Advisory Committee Order 2015 draft, the United Kingdom Government order made under the UK Public Bodies Act 2011. The consent of the Scottish Parliament is required to make an order under Part 1 of the Public Bodies Act 2011, where such an order makes provision which would be within the legislative competence of the Scottish Parliament. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considers and reports on such orders under the same grounds as instruments laid before the Parliament. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on this order, which is worth putting on the record, does seem to abolish a body which really is no longer in existence, never mind doing anything. Does the Committee agree to report that it's content with that order? Agreed. Thank you. At which point we complete the uh, public agenda and we now move into private.